Chapter 5, Part 1 of What Men Live By This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish What Men Live By By Leo Tolstoy Translated by L. and A. Maud Chapter 5 How Much Land Does a Man Need? Part 1 An elder sister came to visit her younger sister in the country. The elder was married to a tradesman in town, the younger to a peasant in the village. As the sisters sat over their tea talking, the elder began to boast of the advantages of town life, saying how comfortably they lived there, how well they dressed, what fine clothes their children wore, what good things they ate and drank, and how she went to the theatre, promenades, and entertainments. The younger sister was piqued, and in turn disparaged the life of a tradesman, and stood up for that of a peasant. "'I would not change my way of life for yours,' said she. "'We may live roughly, but at least we are free from anxiety. You live in better style than we do, but though you often earn more than you need, you are very likely to lose all you have. You know the proverb, loss and gain are brothers twain. It often happens that people who are wealthy one day are begging their bread the next. Our way is safer. Though a peasant's life is not a fat one, it is a long one. We shall never grow rich, but we shall always have enough to eat. The elder sister said sneeringly, Enough! Yes, if you like to share with the pigs and the calves. What do you know of elegance or manners? However much your good man may slave, you will die as you are living, on a dung heap, and your children the same. Well, what of that? replied the younger. Of course our work is rough and coarse, but, on the other hand, it is sure, and we need not bow to any one. But you, in your towns, are surrounded by temptations. Today all may be right, but tomorrow the evil one may tempt your husband with cards, wine, or women, and all will go to ruin. Don't such things happen often enough? Pahom, the master of the house, was lying on the top of the oven, and he listened to the woman's chatter. It is perfectly true, thought he. Busy as we are from childhood tilling Mother Earth, we peasants have no time to let any nonsense settle in our heads. Our only trouble is that we haven't land enough. If I had plenty of land, I shouldn't fear the devil himself. The women finished their tea, chatted a while about dress, and then cleared away the tea things and lay down to sleep. But the devil had been sitting behind the oven and had heard all that was said. He had pleased that the peasant's wife had led her husband into boasting, and that he had said that if he had plenty of land he would not fear the devil himself. All right, thought the devil, we will have a tussle. I'll give you land enough, and by means of that land I will get you into my power. Close to the village there lived a lady, a small landowner, who had an estate of about three hundred acres. She had always lived on good terms with the peasants, until she engaged as her steward an old soldier who took to burdening the people with fines. However careful Pahom tried to be, it happened again and again, that now a horse of his got among the lady's oats, now a cow strayed into her garden, now his calves found their way into her meadows, and he always had to pay a fine. Pahom paid, but grumbled, and, going home in a temper, was rough with his family. All through that summer Pahom had much trouble because of the steward, and he was even glad when winter came and the cattle had to be stabled. Though he grudged the father when they could no longer graze on the pasture land, at least he was free from anxiety about them. In the winter the news got about that the lady was going to sell her land and that the keeper of the inn on the high road was bargaining for it. When the peasants heard this, they were very much alarmed. Well, thought they, if the innkeeper gets the land, he will worry us with fines, worse than the lady's steward. 
We all depend on that estate. So the peasants went on behalf of their commune, and asked the lady not to sell the land to the innkeeper, offering her a better price for it themselves. The lady agreed to let them have it. Then the peasants tried to arrange for the commune to buy the whole estate, so that it might be held by all in common. They met twice to discuss it, but could not settle the matter. The evil one sowed discord among them, and they could not agree. So they decided to buy the land individually, each according to his means, and the lady agreed to this plan as she had to the other. Presently, Pahom heard that a neighbor of his was buying fifty acres, and that the lady had consented to accept one half in cash and to wait a year for the other half. Pahom felt envious. Look at that, thought he. The land is all being sold, and I shall get none of it. So he spoke to his wife. Other people are buying, said he, and we must also buy twenty acres or so. Life is becoming impossible. That steward is simply crushing us with his fines. So they put their heads together and considered how they could manage to buy it. They had one hundred rubles laid by. They sold a colt and one half of their bees, hired out one of their sons as a laborer, and took his wages in advance, borrowed the rest from a brother-in-law, and so scraped together half the purchase money. Having done this, Pahom chose out a farm of forty acres, some of it wooded, and went to the lady to bargain for it. They came to an agreement, and he shook hands with her upon it, and paid her a deposit in advance. Then they went to town and signed the deeds, he paying half the price down and undertaking to pay the remainder within two years. So now Pahom had land of his own. He borrowed seed and sowed it on the land he had bought. The harvest was a good one, and within a year he had managed to pay off his debts both to the lady and to his brother-in-law. So he became a landowner, ploughing and sowing his own land, making hay on his own land, cutting his own trees and feeding his cattle on his own pasture. When he went out to plough his fields, or to look at his growing corn, or at his grass meadows, his heart would fill with joy. The grass that grew and the flowers that bloomed there seemed to him unlike any that grew elsewhere. Formerly, when he had passed by that land, it had appeared the same as any other land, but now it seemed quite different. So Pahom was well contented, and everything would have been right if the neighboring peasants would only not have trespassed on his cornfields and meadows. He appealed to them most civilly. But they still went on. Now the communal herdsmen would let the village cows stray into his meadows, then horses from in the night pasture would get among his corn. Pahom turned them out again and again, and forgave their owners, and for a long time he forbore from prosecuting anyone. But at last he lost patience and complained to the district court. He knew it was the peasants' want of land, and no evil intent on their part that caused the trouble, but he thought, I cannot go on overlooking it, or they will destroy all I have, they must be taught a lesson. So he had them up, gave them one lesson, and then another, and two or three of the peasants were fined. After a time Pahom's neighbors began to bear him a grudge for this, and would now and then let their cattle on his land on purpose. One peasant even got into Pahom's wood at night and cut down five young lime trees for their bark. Pahom, passing through the wood one day, noticed something white, he came nearer and saw the stripped trunks lying on the ground, and close by stood the stumps where the tree had been. Pahom was furious. If he had only cut one here and there, it would have been bad enough, thought Pahom, but the rascal has actually cut down a whole clump. If I could only find out who did this, I would pay him out. He racked his brains as to who it could be. Finally he decided, it must be Simon. No one else could have done it. So he went to Simon's homestead to have a look around, but he found nothing, and only had an angry scene. However, he now felt more certain than ever that Simon had done it, and he lodged a complaint. 
Simon was summoned. The case was tried and retried, and at the end of it all, Simon was acquitted, there being no evidence against him. Pahom felt still more aggrieved, and let his anger loose upon the elder and the judges. "'You let thieves grease your palms,' said he. "'If you were honest folk yourselves, you would not let a thief go free.' So Pahom quarreled with the judges and with his neighbors. Threads to burn his building began to be uttered, so though Pahom had more land, his place in the commune was much worse than before. About this time a rumor got about that many people were moving to new parts. There is no need for me to leave my land, thought Pahom. But some of the others might leave our village, and then there would be more room for us. I would take over their land myself and make my estate a bit bigger. I could then live more at ease. As it is, I am still too cramped to be comfortable. One day Pahom was sitting at home when a peasant passing through the village happened to call in. He was allowed to stay the night, and supper was given him. Pahom had a talk with this peasant and asked him where he came from. The stranger answered that he came from beyond the Volga, where he had been working. One word led to another, and the man went on to say that many people were settling in those parts. He told how some people from his village had settled there. They had joined the commune and had had twenty-five acres per man granted them. The land was so good, he said, that the rice sown on it grew as high as a horse, and so thick that five cuts of a sickle made a sheaf. One peasant, he said, had brought nothing with him but his bare hands, and now he had six horses and two cows of his own. Pahom's heart kindled with desire. He thought, why should I suffer in this narrow hole if one can live so well elsewhere? I will sell my land and my homestead here, and with the money I will start afresh over there and get everything new. In this crowded place one is always having trouble, but I must first go and find out all about it myself. Towards summer he got ready and started. He went down the Volga on a steamer to Samara, then walked another three hundred miles on foot, and at last reached the place. It was just as the stranger had said. The peasants had plenty of land. Every man had twenty-five acres of communal land given him for his use, and anyone who had money could buy, besides at fifty cents an acre, as much good freehold land as he wanted. Having found out all he wished to know, Pahom returned home as autumn came on and began selling off his belongings. He sold his land at a profit, sold his homestead and all his cattle, and withdrew from membership of the commune. He only waited till the spring and then started with his family for the new settlement. As soon as Pahom and his family arrived at their new abode, he applied for admission into the commune of a large village. He stood treat to the elders and obtained the necessary documents. Five shares of communal land were given him for his own and his son's use, that is to say 125 acres, not altogether but in different fields, besides the use of the communal pasture. Pahom put up the buildings he needed and bought cattle. Of the communal land alone he had three times as much as at his former home, and the land was good corn land. He was ten times better off than he had been. He had plenty of arable land and pasturage, and could keep as many head of cattle as he liked. At first, in the bustle of building and settling down, Pahom was pleased with it all, but when he got used to it, he began to think that even here he had not enough land. The first year he sowed wheat on his share of the communal land and had a good crop. He wanted to go on sowing weed, but had not enough communal land for the purpose, and what he had already used was not available, for in those parts weed is only sown on virgin soil or on fallow land. It is sown for one or two years, and then the land lies fallow till it is again overgrown with prairie grass. There were many who wanted such land, and there was not enough for all, so that people quarreled about it. 
Those who were better off wanted it for growing wheat, and those who were poor wanted it to let the dealers so that they might raise money to pay their taxes. Pahom wanted to sow more wheat, so he rented land from a dealer for a year. He sowed much wheat and had a fine crop, but the land was too far from the village. The wheat had to be carted more than ten miles. After a time, Pahom noticed that some peasant dealers were living on separate farms and were growing wealthy. And he thought, if I were to buy some freehold land and have a homestead on it, it would be a different thing altogether. Then it would all be nice and compact. The question of buying freehold land recurred to him again and again. He went on in the same way for three years, renting land and sowing wheat. The seasons turned out well and the crops were good, so that he began to lay money by. He might have gone on living contentedly, but he grew tired of having to rent other people's land every year and having to scramble for it. Wherever there was good land to be had, the peasants would rush for it and it was taken up at once, so that unless you were sharp about it, you got none. It happened in the third year that he and the dealer together rented a piece of pasture land from some peasants, and they had already ploughed it up when there was some dispute and the peasants went to law about it and things fell out so that the labor was all lost. If it were my own land, thought Pahom, I should be independent and there would not be all this unpleasantness. So Pahom began looking out for land which he could buy and he came across a peasant who had bought 1,300 acres, but having got into difficulties was willing to sell again cheap. Pahom bargained and haggled with him, and at last they settled the price at 1,500 rubles, part in cash and part to be paid later. They had all but clinched the matter when a passing dealer happened to stop at Pahom's one day to get a feed for his horse. He drank tea with Pahom, and they had a talk. The dealer said that he was just returning from the land of the Bashkirs, far away, where he had bought 13,000 acres of land, all for 1,000 rubles. Pahom questioned him further, and the tradesman said, All one need do is to make friends with the chiefs. I gave away about 100 rubles worth of dressing gowns and carpets, besides a case of tea, and I gave wine to those who would drink it, and I got the land for less than two cents an acre. And he showed Pahom the title deeds, saying, The land lies near a river, and the whole prairie is virgin soil. Pahom plied him with questions, and the tradesman said, There is more land there than you could cover if you walked a year, and it all belongs to Bashkirs. They are as simple as sheep, and land can be got almost for nothing. There now, thought Pahom, with my one thousand roubles, why should I get only thirteen hundred acres and settle myself with a debt besides? If I take it out there, I can get more than ten times as much for the money. End of section 5